You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Pierre de Rocher, Associate Professor of Geography at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Pierre, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. So today we're going to be discussing the life and work of Jane Jacobs. Jacobs was a thinker and activist who's writing about cities, contributed many original insights about urban life and development. And amazingly, she made all these contributions without ever having a, a PhD or an academic position. So I'd like to hear more about Jacobs, her early life and how she managed to become a thinker without ever becoming an academic. Yes, it's kind of a fascinating story. She was born in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, which, uh, well, is now better known, I guess, because of uh, the TV comedy The Office. But uh, she was born there in the early uh, 20th century. She came from, well, I don't know how prominent her family was, but her father was a well-respected um, a medical doctor uh, in Scranton, and her mother was uh, both a nurse and a teacher at various points of her life. So uh, the, the funny thing about Jacobs is that she later became uh, the urban guru, if you will, of uh, let's call them the gentrifying class. So uh, people who want to live in cities, want to live without cars, and want to have uh, everything within conveniently within walking distance. But if you look at the house she grew in, she actually grew in something that looks like a McMansion today. So very large, very comfortable um, streetcar suburb uh, type of home. So uh, the interesting thing about Jacobs is that uh, Scranton at the time was predominantly Catholic. Uh, it was a mining town, I mean an anthracite coal mining town. But her family was Protestant, and it came from a very old uh, Protestant stock uh, in um, in Virginia. So her, her maiden name was Butzner, so her, her father's name was Butzner. And he grew up in a small uh, rural town, a small farm in Virginia. Her mother came from also a rural area. And one thing that's interesting about her background is that uh, they both met, her parents met in Philadelphia in a big hospital there when uh, Jacob's mother was a nurse. And apparently, if you read what Jacob's has said about that uh, later on in her life, uh, they would always tell her how much better the city, city life was compared to living in almost, you know, subsistence farming type of existence in Virginia. So she grew up in a household where uh, people understood the benefits of uh, living in city. And at the same time, from what I gather, people really, um, I guess you would call them consti uh, constitutionalists today in the American context. Uh, you know, her father apparently often told her that um, the price of freedom was eternal vigilance and uh, winning freedom from the government was something important. So even though she later on became a Canadian, and re but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here and praise Canadian values, she was really raised in the... A typical American household. So, um, so, so that's about her early life. And uh, the interesting thing about her, she was obviously very smart, and she knew from an early age that she would become a writer. But she was completely bored at school, and uh, she said that she enjoyed uh, the first, second, maybe third grade, but that the fourth, by the fourth grade, she had become totally bored, and she would read books under her desk and uh, get really terrible grades. So that explains why later on she really uh, didn't make it to college, at least not at first, because uh, her grades had been so abysmal. But if I'm getting ahead of myself and you want me to expand on the point uh, here, please interrupt me. Well, she's uh, she's famous as a as a New Yorker, as an activist in New yes, York. Exactly, but uh, she became a New Yorker. I mean, a lot of people. Uh, Scranton uh, was, had been a declining town for a few years when she was born, and I think that uh, partly spurred her fascination with uh, the uh, what makes city grow and decay. I mean, Scranton developed as both a uh, coal anthracite mining town, but also what you had in Scranton. Uh, was a female labor force that was available close to New York City. So a lot of textile and related operations relocated to Scranton uh, to take advantage of uh, that female labor pool. And uh, you had other businesses that were created, but not enough to sustain the growth of the city. So by the early 20th century, uh, Scranton had been declining for a while, and a number of people had left uh, Scranton to move to New York. 
And in Jacob's case, her older sister had preceded her, and um, she had moved to um, New York City soon after uh, graduating high school. And a few years later, uh, Jane uh, joined her in uh, New York City. Now, of course, in those days, uh, we're talking about the 1930s here, uh, New York City was in the middle of the Great Depression. I mean, the local economy was better than in many other parts of the United States, but... uh, uh, well, Jacobs, well, uh, I'll call her Jane here because she's not yet uh, Jane Jacobs. She's still Jane Budsner. Uh, struggled to find a job. I mean, she had learned a skill. Her father had insisted on that. Uh, so she was something of, uh, of a stenographer. And so she found a number of jobs in uh, various small businesses, you know, everything from making clocks to making candies. And uh, so she would uh, be employed for a few weeks, a few months, uh, lose her job, then look for something else. But at the same time, she uh, was always uh, aiming to be a writer. So she began writing uh, pieces that were picked up by fairly prominent uh, magazines uh, like Vogue, for example, at the time. So she began writing about um, the uh, working districts of New York City, you know, uh, the fur and diamond districts, the flower districts. She was always fascinated by these uh, concentrations of businesses and what made them thick. And also, uh, at the time, she uh, discovered their Greenwich Village, which at the time was uh, the center, well, it's still today to a large extent, of uh, bohemian life in uh, New York City. So she ran into a lot of artists and what have you. So uh, eventually, by the late 1930s, she began to find uh, steady employment uh, as a writer. So she worked on... I mean, the advantage of being located in New York City is that you had a number of uh, industry publications in the town. I mean, this is where New York was and still is to this day the heart of uh, the U.S. publishing industry, although obviously uh, the industry has changed in the last few decades. But let's just say for younger people that before the Internet came along, if you were a writer, being in New York City was a big advantage. So she uh, she worked for a while for a steel industry magazine. So... Uh, She visited a lot of businesses along the eastern seaboard. She would go to industry conferences. And her job was to report about various developments and economic issues within uh, the steel industry. She later worked for uh, the U.S. government for... um, During the Second World War, she wrote, um, she edited a number of things for the U.S. government, and uh, eventually this job moved into a magazine that was called America, which was, believe it or not, a magazine that was put together by the U.S. government to be sent to the Soviet Union. So she (laughs) would write articles about various aspects of American life, which would then be translated in Russian and uh, be uh, distributed in the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union at the same time had a similar magazine uh, for the United States. So remember, this is before the beginning of the real Cold War of the 1950s. And so there were, you know, the Soviets were still American allies, uh, you know, during and shortly after the Second World War. So she did that for a while. But eventually uh, that uh, magazine was relocated to Washington, D.C., but she didn't want to leave uh, Greenwich Village. So what had happened um, in the meantime is that she had met uh, an architect, uh, Robert Jacobs, who sort of introduced her to the world of uh, uh, both urban planning but also architecture. So she ended up getting uh, a gig, a job with Architectural Forum, which was... Uh, one of the two, I don't know if you could say it was the most influential architectural magazine in the United States, but it was certainly very important. And she was being a generalist, not being someone with an architectural background, she was given a variety of beats uh, within uh, that magazine, one of which uh, was uh, the hospital beat, so building new hospitals and doing things like that. So she would be sent a bunch of blueprints and being asked to comment about hospital, and at first she was completely baffled by that. But it so happens, again, that her husband was an architect, so he could sort of uh, he educated her. She did not get any formal education in architecture, but her husband was an architect, so he obviously taught her a lot. And because of the gig she got in um, recovering uh, hospitals, he came to learn about that, and he actually specialized in practice in uh, building hospitals. And uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but suffice it to say that when they relocated to Toronto in the late 1960s, uh, he was uh, an important architect in designing many of the main hospitals in Toronto. So if you ever go down 
uh, University Avenue. You know, you've got the big university hospitals close to the University of Toronto. Well, her husband played a prominent role in building those in the ni late 1960s and early uh, 1970s. So, uh, but she was a writer, but also in the 1930s in New York City, she uh, did attend uh, Columbia University for a little while, but uh, the extension school, you know, the same school that uh, graduated people like, you know, Jacques Pépin, a famous uh, chef, went to that. And uh, she did take a few economic geography uh, classes there, which would, I think, uh, be important later on. So she never got her degree, but uh, as an economic geographer, I can tell you that at the time, uh, Columbia University was probably one of the top three uh, economic uh, geography departments, uh, or at least uh, within the geography program, uh, economic geography at uh, Columbia was probably one of the uh, top three programs in the United States at the time. So she took a few courses there, and I think she got a good education, even though uh, she never really got a degree, and at one point, the university realized how bad her high school grades had been, so that's also part of the reason why she left, and she never completed her degrees. But uh, but she she learned a lot of things about, you know, the real uh, world of business in the 1930s and 40s. She married an architect who taught her a lot, and she learned a little bit um, at uh, Columbia University, I believe a strong influence on her was the Belgian historian Henri Piren. If you know anything about uh, Piren, he's kind of the most influential thinker on how cities emerged uh, beginning in the 11th and 12th century in Europe and how they helped uh, gain freedom for European people. So, in a way, she channeled her inner Piren for the rest of her life. But anyway, the point <laughs> uh, I'm going, uh, I'm stretching myself here. But the point is that by the late 1940s, uh, she's become well established as an architectural riot, uh, writer. She has an eclectic background, not only about urban design and the architecture of building, but also about economic life. And I mean, real world economic life, not theoretical economics, um, theoretical economic life because of her background. And one thing that never changed about uh, Jacobs is that she was an unconventional thinker. I think that was her main strength. In a way, you know, uh, being an outsider often gives you a different perspective on things. And uh, in the 1950s, she became very disillusioned with uh, what was known then as uh, urban renewal uh, in the United States. So, uh, are, are there any questions you want to ask at this point? Did I go too fast or something? Oh no, it's excellent. Um, so the the urban renewal movement was was yes. a a movement. Okay, to... the urban renewal movement was something that was really horrible, and unfortunately, um, I don't know if I should be. I hope you don't lose any listeners because of that. But you know, the type of architecture that became popular in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s is the one that is sort of uh, sometimes championed by Ayn Rand in her novel. You know, as far as the design of building goes, you know, that could be one thing. But the problem with urban renewal is that um, the belief was that, uh, you know, the problem with poor people and what would be called slum back then, so, you know, small tenement buildings and people being in the street, the, the belief among many reformers is that uh, people were not living up to their potential because they were not living in pleasant surroundings. So the mm -hmm. idea was that you would bring in the bulldozer, uh, raise the complete neighborhood, and then build huge towers in a park. Uh, so very high buildings, uh, that way you would still have density uh, within cities, but at the same time you, will have, uh, you would have a lot of grass around uh, those buildings, and you could have big boulevards, uh, big boulevards uh, in between them. So it was a very uh, Soviet-style approach to um, urban planning, and I, if I may tell a personal anecdote about that. So uh, in the late 1990s, I did a postdoctoral degree at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and it was in an urban studies program. And the program had been created a couple of decades before to build uh, links again with the Soviet Union. And when people at Johns Hopkins and Soviet University ask, well, what is exactly the same in a way between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union? What do we have in common? And the answer they came up with was urban planning, because urban planning in the United States was pretty much conducted along Soviet lines. So you would have uh, neighborhoods where you would have you know, small uh, blocks, small buildings, 
a lot of, uh, let's say, stores on uh, the first floor uh, looking over uh, the sidewalk. And you would have people obviously living there, spending time outside, you know, sitting in stairs and playing on the sidewalk. And to urban planners, that was terrible. Hmm. Uh, what poor people needed really was grass and open space. And so... Uh, Jacobs gets out of the uh, hospital beat and she's charged with looking at the impact of urban renewal, how cities are being improved. So she goes to a number of cities along the eastern seaboard. Uh, I mean, she writes a lot about New York City where she's based, but she obviously goes to Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore to see what uh, you know, progress has been delivered through urban renewal. And what's interesting is that at the time, uh, her magazine, I mean, the editors are really supportive of that, uh, like many... Uh, uh, like many urban planners and architects, you know, they view uh, cities as a map on which you put colors. So one color is the central business district, another business, uh, another color is uh, the retail district, another color is the residential place, and then another area for manufacturing. So Jacobs goes to a number of cities, again, from Boston to Baltimore, and she realizes that the more cities get renewed, the worse they get. Crime goes up. Uh, you know, community networks are destroyed, uh, gangs quickly take over uh, public housing projects, and, uh, you know, she talks to people, and she gets the same kind of answers uh, over and over again. You know, nobody asked us what we wanted, they, they, our, phrase, our friends were chased away from here, there's no place where we can buy a newspaper, uh, we have no place to hang out, gangs have taken over the building, uh, our life is hell. <laughs> And so, um, obviously, she, she, she's not uh, insensitive to that. And her most important uh, connection in that respect would be some activist in uh, what is now uh, Harlem in, uh, in Manhattan, in New York City. So you have some social workers at the time who knew what the, um, the neighborhood looked like. And that area of uh, Harlem will become the main demonstration project for urban renewal. So again, government authorities come in, they raise the whole thing, they destroy uh, thousands of business, they don't give good, they don't give adequate compensation for owners, and again, uh, uh, more crime. Uh, all those social networks are destroyed. People uh, don't have their local churches anymore. And so eventually, she begins uh, to be vocal about that. She begins to write columns that are critical. Um, and to their credit, their editors, who are, again, in general, support, uh, supportive of um, modern planning practices, uh, let, let her go ahead. And at some point, she's asked to step in for a bus at a big conference uh, at Harvard in uh, 1956, I believe. And she delivers a paper there where she describes, uh, you know, what has been going on in Harlem and how... Uh, urban planners are completely oblivious to what makes a neighborhood uh, fu functional, which are, again, mostly about, you know, interactions between people and having different kinds of people on the street at different times of the day and the importance of small stores as keeping an eye on the street, uh, keeping the neighborhood safe, keeping the sidewalks under control. And she's a big hit. So uh, there are a few important people that day, but she gets an offer from a Fortune magazine, not her, uh, not from her, her own magazine, to write an article which is called Downtown is for People, in which she will expand on her ideas. And so she does. Um, at first, the editors of Fortune are reportedly very uh, reluctant to publish the piece, but eventually they do the real end. They sort of let this kind of unknown, uh, untrained uh, journalist uh, pen that piece. And it quickly becomes one of the most uh, talked about piece that was ever published in, uh, in Fortune magazine. So uh, based on that, she uh, eventually gets a grant uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation to expand on the ideas that uh, she's put forward uh, in that article. And so she gets, uh, she had never written anything more than a column before or essays of a few pages. So uh, she says yes, but then she needs a little bit more time because writing a book is more than uh, what she had planned uh, to do. But at the same time, um, her ideas, I mean, her, her topic really expands from, you know, the importance of sidewalks and life on the street for city safety to, 
a uh, major attack on urban renewal and what uh, urban planners are doing to American cities at the time. And so the book is eventually published in 1961. Uh, 1961. It's called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And it's arguably the most important uh, urban book or urban theory book published in the last 60 years. I mean, to this day, it's still uh, mandatory readings in a number of architecture uh, and uh, urban planning schools. And the sort of unconventional ideas that she put forward at the time, again, the importance of the importance of mixing things and making sure that you have all sorts of people on the street at different times of the days, uh, short blocks as opposed to... Uh, high towers with a lot of grass in between them, um, the importance of local community, social capital. I mean, she's the first thinker who comes up with the, the expression social capital. Uh, all these things today have become conventional wisdom, although interpreted in ways that uh, people like us might disagree with, but they're kind of the conventional will, uh, wisdom that is now being taught uh, in urban planning school and what people called the new urbanists say that they're doing. So she becomes overnight something of a minor intellectual celebrity and um, urban planning was never the same afterwards, even though it took a little bit of time for people to uh, revise what they had been doing and to uh, recognize that a number of them, I guess, uh, had made American cities much worse uh, than if they had never showed up. So was her book mainly read by uh, intellectuals, or was it broadly popular? It was broadly popular because at the time, remember, uh, a number of cities are being destroyed, uh, not only uh, along the eastern seaboard, but uh, all, over, uh, all over the U.S. So you have a number of activists who realize, who don't want their neighborhood to see destroyed, saying, okay, we might be poor, but we don't live in a slum. And so what Jacob says is that in a way she sort of articulated the gut feeling of a number of uh, community activists at the time were just people whose neighborhood was being destroyed who would never have been uh, an activist uh, overall. So it was not a uh, major bestseller the way, let's say, a novel would be, obviously, but it was read by a lot of people uh, who mattered, I believe, not only in academia, but also people who were uh, fighting to keep the bulldozers away. And so that way it became extremely influential. So, But, um, I mean, the, I've never seen any figure as to how many books she, said, uh, she sold, but it's usually described as a minor bestseller. Uh, it's kind of a thick book, I mean, but uh, Jacobs is a first-rate stylist, and so it's an easy read. And uh, she she sort of takes no prisoners in terms of uh, her style, and she says, you know, this book is an attack against urban planning. Uh, what they've done is not the rebuilding of cities, but the sacking of cities. And uh, she was always very good when she was uh, fighting. Also, she she was involved in a number of civic struggles in New York City, and she was uh, she was always a favorite of journalists because she she had the sense to come up with very good one-liners. Mm. So uh, could you could you talk a little bit more about her activism? Yes, well, she lived in the Greenwich Village. Uh, again, I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with um, New York City, but basically Greenwich Village is unlike many other neighborhoods in New York because it's not really designed on a grid pattern. It's been something of a bohemian neighborhood for a while. It's where New York University is. Uh, Washington Square, if that tells anything to your reader, but just south of it is uh, Soho, so south of Houston Street, and uh, the, both Greenwich Village and Soho are very, you know, you've got to be a supermodel or working on Wall Street to be able to uh, live there today, but in the 1950s, uh, that's not what they were. I mean, uh, Greenwich Village was, uh, was gentrifying, but the goal of the authorities in New York City at the time was to have a downtown expressway run through them. So uh, a large portion of these neighborhoods uh, were slated for demolition. And um, so Jacobs got involved in a fight on that. She was also involved in a fight to uh, save uh, Washington Square, to close it uh, to um, car traffic. Uh, at one point... Uh, uh, the street she was living on was set, uh, to, uh, the, the sidewalks were set to be essentially um, shortened and more to more car traffic was supposed to go there. So she was involved in a number of fights uh, against uh, what she called highwaymen and also other types of uh, projects at the time. Now the thing, uh, the thing about the fight uh, that she was involved in is that they were typically um, involving um, 
upper middle class gentrifying uh, white types, but uh, they were people who were able to organize and they knew how to go against uh, City Hall and the federal government. The problem with urban renewal is that the federal government uh, in the U.S. made a lot of money available uh, to cities to carry on these policies. And when you know anything about, uh, especially New York City politics, Tammany Hall, the tradition there, the idea was that you could never defeat City Hall. But in the end, those people succeeded, both because uh, they were kind of influential. I mean, they were they were not the wealthy types. You know, it was not uh, the Upper East Side, but still, I mean, they were educated people. And they had a few friendly moles in the... Um, administrations that were running urban renewal who told them how to uh, beat the project and in essence what they had to say is that uh, they never had to say they were often asked well what do you want and the mistake they would have made and what they were warned not to do is to say something specific other than removing the slum designation that had been put uh, on their neighborhood but because if they had said well we would like more tree we would like a school whatever it might have been used as a uh, by bureaucrats as an excuse to run through their project so they were able to educate themselves and find uh, be able to um, ask for things that would not give the bureaucrats any excuse to run these things through. So, But also at the same time, by the early uh, and the mid-1960s, the failure of uh, urban renewal projects, and especially big public housing projects, has become obvious uh, to most people. I mean, of course, uh, a lot of activists have read Jacobs, but also at the same time, a lot of people realize uh, what uh, social disarray is created by destroying functioning but poor neighborhoods and replacing them with big public housing projects. So it's a combination of things, I believe, people being fed up of uh, public housing projects, politicians realizing that there is growing opposition to that and not wanting to go against the electorate, and uh, Jacobs providing some intellectual ammunition in her environment. So, uh, I mean, in New York City, and inspiring people elsewhere. So, a number of uh, gains were achieved, but it was really, um, it, it's really where I guess the image of Jacobs as a housewife who went against um, the public bureaucracy in New York City emerged. Although, uh, I guess she would have been the first to admit that she was part of a movement. But she was not the only person that defeated the, the powers that be at City Hall. And today, though, and perhaps we'll discuss this later, uh, people who claim her legacy or say that are inspired by her turn her into this sort of superwoman who did everything on her own against City Hall. And, but of course, there were uh, many other people involved. She could not have succeeded on her own. So eventually, uh, she found herself uh, opposing the, the Vietnam War. Yes, and... Uh, the problem she has is that she has two sons who are of draft age. Well, to be honest, um, I'm not sure if I should say this, but one was a physicist who I think worked uh, a bit in the military industry, so there's no way he was going to be drafted. But he has a brother who was something of an artist who was likely to be drafted. So uh, because she opposed the Vietnam War, uh, she did like a number of... Uh, Americans in those days. I mean, we hear a lot about um, Americans today saying they're fed up with their country and moving to Canada. Actually, a, a number of them uh, did that in the 1960s. And uh, the Jacobs uh, were one of them. So they visited Toronto. And the reason why they went to Toronto rather than Montreal is because they didn't speak French. And uh, the um, her husband saw that uh, Toronto was undergoing a reconstruction boom and that, you know, big hospitals would be built. And he realized that he could make a living uh, building hospitals in Toronto, which he ended up doing. So eventually they packed their bags. Uh, they moved to uh, Toronto. And the irony is that uh, they rent a place on uh, Spadina Avenue, which uh, they soon learn is slated to be demolished and uh, replaced, uh, and to make in order to make room for a big highway that would connect uh, the waterfront in Toronto to essentially what is the 401 uh, today. So, for your listeners who know a little bit uh, about Toronto, it's what we call today the Robert Allen Expressway that sort of goes out of the 401, but then just dies. Uh, you know, a few kilometers south of the 401. Now, again, a number of people today believe that uh, Jacobs was uh, instrumental in defeating that project, but truth be told, it probably would have been defeated anyway because uh, the highway would have run through the wealthiest area of Toronto and mm. then the neighborhood of the University of Toronto. So there was already a lot of opposition 
uh, before uh, the JCOM showed up, and most of the opposition and the political battles had been won uh, even before she really got involved. But then she became um, very influential in Toronto. I mean, there's another theory. Um, I, I think it's true to an extent, but she re they really move in order to get uh, their sons out of you know the, the risk of going to Vietnam. But uh, she moved to Toronto also in part because she was tired of fighting uh, City Hall uh, in New York City. And she always really wanted to be a writer first and an activist a distant second or not too much if she could avoid it. But in Toronto, even though she she was mostly a writer and was not uh, overtly active, uh, she was very influential and was always listened to by uh, a number of people who were actually rebuilding and remaking Toronto at the time. And a lot of people would sort of seek her blessings and invite her to show up at uh, various things. So Toronto is, uh, well, not paradoxically, but perhaps not surprisingly, I would argue the city in North America that bears are in print uh, the most. And so a number of mayors, I mean, uh, either left-wing or center-right, uh, sought her advice. And uh, she was influential in, uh, I would say, perhaps a more indirect way than uh, a lot of people who believe today that, you know, she was this constant presence among uh, activists in Toronto. But of course, she provided a lot of impact on uh, you know, the rebuilding of uh, St. Lawrence Market, uh, the way neighborhoods are structured, uh, more introducing more flexible zoning regulations and things like that. So that was always Jacob's strength in a way. She had supporters in both, you know, the peak oil, uh, down with the car crowd. And uh, Bill Buckley included uh, excerpts of uh, the death and life of great American city uh, in an anthology of the best American conservative writings of the 20th century. So um, she always had this capacity. Uh, I think it was a deliberate strategy on her part to try to uh, look as non-ideological as she could then because... Uh, there is something in her writings that will appeal to everybody. Uh, a number of people from various political perspectives took ideas that they liked from her and ignored the rest. And so that's why, in a way, I guess she was so influential and uh, so, uh, I guess, beloved or at least respected in Toronto. Uh, did she have much impact on the faculty of the University of Toronto? Well, that's funny because, well, this is a second-hand information, but uh, of course, uh, the University of Toronto has a big urban planning department. And I know something about it because this is my formal affiliation. I mean, uh, my main office is at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, but I'm also affiliated with uh, the Department of uh, Geography and Urban Planning on the main campus. Now, the thing about Jacobs is that she lived uh, in the Annex, which is the neighborhood, you know, right west of the uh, University of Toronto main campus. But for a number of reasons, uh, Jacobs never liked academics. I mean, um, I guess it's part of part of it was not having a degree, but also. Um, perhaps have been uh, looked down upon in the 40s and 50s uh, when she was a journalist. And for example, as soon as she got a, her grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, she was invited at MIT by uh, where some social scientists wanted to essentially guide her in terms of what she was going to do. And she, she said, now these guys don't care about cities. They don't, they don't want to understand cities. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And so she was always uh, reluctant to be associated with academics. She even that turned down an honorary uh, doctorate degree from Harvard, among other things. But uh, I don't know how many uh, doctorate degree, uh, honorary degrees she turned down, but uh, apparently it's quite a few and from uh, important places. The only, one of the few things she ever accepted was the, the Jefferson Medal at the University of Virginia because, again, of the Virginia connection of her family. So, But apart from this, uh, she always wanted to stay away from academics. And so I'm told that my colleagues... Uh, at the University of Toronto, but that's obviously a previous generation, I mean the generation before I was there, uh, would invite her, but uh, she wouldn't want to show up, or else if she was going to talk to students, she would not talk to them on campus. So again, uh, that was perhaps a bit unfair, but that's the way, unfair to my colleagues, but uh, that's the way she generally behaves towards academics. I mean, there was no love lost there, although as far as I know, there was no personal animosity between uh, Jacobs and any of the uh, urban uh, planning faculty. But again, I mean, this is, uh, this is second-hand information. Uh, I cannot vouch for this. So um, 
Can you talk a little bit about Jacob's ideas as they are significant to economists and yeah, that's the thing. I mean, Jacob's beliefs, but I mean, something that is lost on many uh, commentators is that she thought her main intellectual contribution was not in the area of uh, urban planning or urban theory per se, uh, but economic development. So I already told you that uh, the first successful pieces she wrote in the 1930s and early 1940s were essentially about, you know, the working districts or industrial districts of New York City and various other aspects of economic life. And her first uh, serious journalistic gig was essentially an economic one. And so perhaps because uh, she was from Scranton and also because of the decay she was seeing at the time in many industrial cities in the United States, because again, she was very familiar with most of the uh, northeastern seaboard industrial cities of the United States, uh, she figured that um, the key to understand city was really economics. It was not really culture. I mean, she viewed cities as economic engines, places where entrepreneurs can find a supportive environment. Um, there are a number of other advantages to cities, again. And she had been introduced to these ideas in Colombia uh, a number of decades before, but uh, she was really interested in to the old question as to why is it that some city grow and prosper and others stagnate and decay. So um, I've been through her archives and I can tell you that when she was uh, writing uh, Death and Life, she was already thinking about that and she wrote a few drafts about economic development, but they did not find um, their way into her book. So once Death and Life was published, uh, she turned her attention to the issue of economic development and she published in 1969 uh, a book called The Economy of Cities, which was actually her favorite book. I mean, I have my autograph copy. I mean, I, I knew Jacobs personally, and she says, well, this is my favorite book, and she's on the record as saying a few things about that. And what's interesting is that some economists, uh, more pro most prominently Robert Lucas, the uh, Nobel uh, winning economist, thought that she should have been awarded a Nobel Prize for that book, a Nobel Prize uh, for economics in that book. So uh, I won't get into the details. I mean, a lot of the ideas in there will be um, intuitively familiar to people who come from, let's say, an unconventional background like the Austrian School of Economics. But suffice it to say that her book is all about uh, entrepreneurship and technological change. And what I like about it is that she does not feel compelled to position herself um, compared to the standard economic literature. So one problem, for example, I always had with some Austrian writers who write about entrepreneurship is that they feel compelled to say, well, entrepreneurship leads us towards equilibrium and stuff. And there, there's, no, there's nothing like that in Jacobs. It's all about, uh, in a way, let's say, creative destruction, but at a much more down-to-earth level than most economists. Um, would discuss. So she first, uh, she opens her book. Her methodology uh, differed uh, slightly from those of economists. I mean, she was influenced in the 1950s by the uh, literature on emerging complex, uh, complex systems at the time, so, or organized complexity. And so a lot of uh, people uh, writing in the medical sciences, trying to understand, you know, ecosystems or the way the human body works, were essentially advocating an inductivist methodology, which is uh, what she used, uh, which is what she used. So unlike economists, who tends to be deductive and start, let's say, from first principle and understand reality from that, uh, the way she tried to understood the world was to collect examples of behavior and see if patterns were emerging in the process. And I think one, uh, her approach might have been problematic at some level. I mean, I won't get into the details today, but uh, it, allow her, it allowed her, I think, to develop a theory of entrepreneurship and technological change that, you know, uh, did not respect any uh, academic barriers. So she does discuss, for example, well, where do people get ideas? Uh, why is diversity good to start a business? Uh, why is a more diverse environment more likely to lead to new business formation and different lines of work? And all sorts of issues that economists were not really addressing because they were still caught in, let's say, the equilibrium uh, regional specialization mindset. So uh, the way, I mean, again, she organized a lot of ideas that obviously had been around 
people have been writing about economic development for a very long time. And she will quote people in her book, like, you know, Herodotus, Aristotle, Plato, and, uh, you know, a number of writers that she learned from, uh, Pirenne and others uh, after him. But she really came up again with something of a structural theory of uh, technological change that I believe has no equivalent in the economic literature because of her, um, di uh, because of its dynamic character. And the real, what I think a lot of economic listeners or a lot of economists would gain from her is a better understanding of the role of city, perhaps a more realistic take on entrepreneurship. And uh, a sense that, you know, she has identified patterns that have been around for thousands of years that have been neglected in the last uh, few, um, well, let's say the last few decades uh, by mainstream economic theory. I mean, there was a small branch of economic analysis called regional science or the world. So if you're an economist in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, but by and large, they were completely peripheral to the economic uh, profession. I mean, most of them would even have jobs in, God forbid, urban planning department rather than uh, economics department. But then in the late 1980s, with, you know, free trade uh, making, in essence, um, you know, trade barriers disappear between country, you've got international trade theorists, most prominently Paul Krugman, uh, Paul Krugman when he was still a good economist, mm -hmm. uh, realizing, okay, well, what am I, uh, you know, what am I going to do with my model now if you don't have barriers between countries? And he realized, oh, well, there is this thing called economic geography, and it's interesting. And in 1988, though, what's more uh, important for Jacobs is that, again, Robert Lucas wrote a uh, paper on uh, economic development in which he sort of reviews the whole theories, uh, the theories that exist, points out, well, they have problems. And in the end, he says, well, what matters is knowledge, but we need to go beyond, you know, the standard approach to knowledge, you know, R&D patents or academics, what have you. What I have in mind is more something like uh, Jane Jacobs said in a remarkable book, the economy of cities. And he leaves it at that. He does not really expand upon that. But by writing about Jacobs in 88, he made um, discussing her work uh, respectable. Because that's one thing about Jacobs, you know, that regional science urban economic tradition was certainly as mathematical as almost anything in economics at the time. And uh, people writing within that tradition would be aware of Jacobs, but would never refer to her because, you know, she was not one of them. But then you've got Lucas, and then you've got uh, two big names, uh, Scheichmann at the University of Chicago, Schlaefer at Harvard, and uh, one of their students, Ed Glazer, who's now uh, a prominent urban economist at Harvard, who actually came up with a paper uh, in the early 1990s in the, the Journal of Political Economy, so obviously, arguably one of the top two uh, economics uh, journals in the world, or at least in the United States. Uh, where they come up with this notion that, uh, well, they sort of expand on new growth theory. Uh, and stop me if this is too arcane for your listeners, but uh, oh, it's basically, good. it's good. Okay, so basically, economists rediscover the importance of knowledge in the 1980s through the work of Paul Romer and increasing returns and what have you. And so, what uh, shake. Uh, Schlaefer, Schleichmann, Glazer, and another, well, I mean, Glazer was a student at the time. I don't know if he originated the idea. I've never, behind that paper, I've never asked him. Uh, what they do is that they basically distinguish between the ideas of, on the one hand, Alfred Marshall, Kenneth Arrow, and uh, Paul Romer, who argue that, well, you know, the bigger a firm is, the more the, spill it, the, more the knowledge spillovers are retained within the firm, and this is better for growth. So in the context of a city, you should have, you know, one big large firm that does a lot of R&D and that should create more job. Then at the time, uh, you have uh, Harvard uh, management theorist Michael Porter who wrote, uh, made a name and a fortune for himself writing about competitiveness. And in the big book he publishes in the early 1990s, he realizes that, oh my God, the, you know, the economic geography matters. I found out that in many countries, the industries that are the most competitive are actually clusters of firms within a location. So a bunch of firms related to one another producing, you know, one type of thing, roughly, let's say Silicon Valley in the United States or, you know, the financial district in New York City or the publishing district in New York City. Typically, the most competitive industries the world over are take this sort of cluster form as opposed to being a, a large firm. And if I'm not wrong, I think Porter actually uh, 
cites Jacobs. He, she's sort of buried in a footnote in his book. So, but the point is, is that he, he discovers economic geography and he writes that book. So, um, so within the the uh, Shankman and Company paper, um, so you have on the one hand uh, Marshall Arrow Romer who say, well, one large firm in one city, you know, the bigger the better, the spillovers will be retained. Then you've got the theory of Porter, which says that, well, you know, you need a bunch of small firms related, but in close proximity, competition is more important than um, retaining ideas within a firm because then you, if you don't innovate your neighbor will you'll be driven out of business so actually competition is more important and then they compare that to uh, Jacob's theory which uh, you know Jacob's again always knew about industrial clusters she was writing about that in the 1930s again but she pointed out that well essentially the essence of human creativity is to combine things uh, that were not combined before and so the most important knowledge spillovers in any one line of business will come from outside will come from people with other ideas or other expertise or else uh, people within one line of work will see applications for their knowledge in something else. And so basically they look at all the metropolitan, uh, so again Glazer and company look at uh, the metropolitan, uh, all the employment data that they can find over the large, uh, in the large American cities from the mid 1950s to the late 1980s. And lo and behold, I remember from the paper, they said, well, the results were so obvious that you did not even need to run the regression. I mean, you could just see it from the data. And Jacobs turned out to be the winner. So this, this paper became the most influential in urban economics and economic geography over the last two decades. And it sort of spanned a little cottage industry on measuring, you know, Marshall versus Porter versus Jacobs externalities. The problem, though, with this literature is that uh, they never really said what they were measuring because um, they framed their paper in the context of new growth theory and they sort of stretched Jacobs' writing a little bit to make her say what they wanted her to say and they never specified the spillover mechanism so basically you you have a result uh, saying well more diversity equals more job growth and what explains that well of course knowledge spillovers so I personally came across the work of Jacobs I was an undergraduate uh, I came across her work uh, before I ran into the Glazer paper I'd sort of read her thing and then I had heard, I, uh, I read about this paper and I read it and I was like, well, you know, I'm not that smart. I'm just a, a puppy. <laughs> I don't know much. I was in my early 20s in the day at the time. But I decided that, you know, there is something there. And I wrote my dissertation on that topic. So I got into an urban economics program in my own town of Montreal. And the first thing I do is I go see my professors who came from the regional science tradition. They were, they were not used to mainstream economists. Uh, writing about the uh, cities and I said I asked him well have you heard about this paper said no no what is that and I said well they, they've measured Jacobs and I remember my professor what they've measured Jacobs how can you measure Jacobs you cannot measure Jacobs so I show him the paper and he goes like oh my god this is so bad what are they measuring here this doesn't make any sense but of course you know this was a professor in Montreal as opposed to the big shot in Chicago and Harvard and I'm like well I would like to explain the black box that they're not discussing and I ended up uh, writing my dissertation on that and uh, if, I, if I may toot my own horn I think I'm the only person who ever wrote a couple of papers explaining how these things actually occur in the real world but suffice it to say that uh, Jacob's externalities so again knowledge transfer within cities between different lines of work have become an expression that is fairly well known uh, among economists uh, these days but it is probably fair to say that most of them uh, I don't know if you're an economist by training, but most economists don't really like to read books. I mean, unless they're Austrians or <laughs> Marxists or something. So I suspect that a lot of economists who have tried to measure uh, Jacob externalities and, you know, people have used patterns, they've used all sorts of other data, have actually never read her. So she's become, among e mainstream economists anyway, something of a concept as opposed to someone who wrote books that covered a whole range of topics, introduced things like entrepreneurship, technological change, and things that I believe, you know, would be en enlightening or at least inspiring uh, to economists if they were to read her. But I don't think that this is the case. Now, this being said, she later wrote uh, a couple of other books on economics. And, um, I mean, there, there are some flaws in them. The, the thing with Jacobs is that, again, she was not a trained economist. So, 
Uh, again, not being an expert in a field is a good thing. You can look at things with fresh eyes, but sometimes also you commit uh, basic mistakes. And uh, I believe that in her other books, there were some... Uh, she, she came to view cities as, you know, things that exist in and out uh, of themselves, essentially. I mean, in her early writing on economics, she always emphasized the role of specific entrepreneurs, or she discusses cases of, uh, you know, job, for, job creation or business formation uh, with very concrete example. But in her later book, she sort of looks at everything within the lights of cities as almost living organism, although the notion that cities are essentially built also a long distance straight doesn't quite square with the way she describes them. Again, I don't want to um, get into the details. I, I suspect that economists who will read her books will find a lot that they agree with, that they might find a bit obvious, a lot that they disagree with, saying that she, she makes some basic mistakes that perhaps if she had been trained as an economist, she would not have made. But they will also find a number of ideas that they probably never thought of and never, never uh, thought about. And I believe that this is the value of uh, reading her work. So at least that's certainly how I've looked at it. I mean, um, the other thing too is that, I mean, she wrote at the time, her knowledge of economics is very much what, you know, a layperson would have had in, the, let's say, uh, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. So, basically, basically, she hates Keynesian economics. She thinks it's all nonsense, and, of course, I agree with her. But at the same time, uh, she's not aware of, let's say, a broader tradition that perhaps that she'd been more familiar with, it, uh, let's say, spontaneous order or something, that she might have found uh, congenial. And uh, she also, in her first book, do not discuss things that I believe are important. Like, for example, she will discuss urban decay without discussing rent control. It barely appears in her book, and she somehow doesn't seem to have made the connection between rent control and the destruction of cities. Uh, I mean, in, at the level she did, but not as much as most economists would like. Um, she's also not very... Uh, good at grasping the importance of the price system. That's, uh, that's I think, uh, another flaw in her work. And, uh, again, methodologically, there might be some things that uh, you don't really uh, quite agree with her. And then uh, supply and demand, she somehow believes that you can, so ev even though she was much more opposed to zoning than, you know, most urban planners that you'll ever run into, it seems to me that she never quite understood that by essentially preserving the historic character of a place like Greenwich Village, you would eventually price out most people. So the idea of preserving the historic character of a desirable location and the unavoidable rise in price that would uh, occur as you prevented, uh, you know, the demolition of a few buildings to build larger but well-taught uh, structure with, you know, uh, the, the, a store on the first floor and, you know, good tenants that would not... Uh, be prone to be taken over by gangs. These sorts of issues are a bit irritating with her. And I can say on a personal level that, you know, I talked to her maybe 10 hours in my life. And at one point, uh, I'm with her, I'm with uh, my wife and a few friends. And my wife was an economist who does not realize, who's not as awestruck and me and the other people who knew Jacobs were, was. My wife, matter of factly, asked her at one point, well, yes, but you know, we're newcomers to this city. We were, we're in a house in the annex in our living room. You know, we would like to live close to the downtown campus, but we can't afford it. So what's wrong with uh, tearing down a few stores on Bloor Street and building high rises? And we then experienced what was known on the annex as Jacob's Rat. <laughs> she, she became really mad at us, and she said, you know, it's community. People have struggled for this and that. And I said, well, yeah. And my wife piled on a bit. Well, yeah, but isn't that unfair if you're not born in this neighborhood or if you did not move into it when that was, um, you know, more affordable? I mean, basically, what about us, you know? And she could sort of never reconcile herself with issues like that, that if you want to make a city more affordable, You've got to accept that certain features of a neighborhood will have to go and that some high rises might have to be built, if nothing else, on the larger streets. So, you know, she was not perfect in that respect. Uh, there were aspects of her work that uh, economists would find a bit dubious. But overall, I believe that she was certainly um, 
a net plus for the study of cities. And again, the most influential urban writer of the last few decades, and that a number of people, both within and outside of economics, uh, would benefit from familiarizing themselves with her work. So earlier you mentioned uh, spontaneous order, which is an idea associated with Hayek. Is there a parallel between Jacobs and Hayek? Well, I can tell you that Murray Rothbard did actually review the uh, economy of cities and really liked it. And Hayek also reportedly was also a fan of her work, although I never found any formal review of her work. But but it's all in there. I mean, in a way, she sort of... um, Again, I, I believe that her main early influence was probably Henri Pirenne, who was who's been indirectly very influential among the spontaneous order tradition, or at least you know the spontaneous reemergence of cities and trade in uh, medieval Europe, and now, let's see, the Champagne Fair and uh, and other things, the rebirth of you know commercial life in Europe. So so she came from that, and I believe that uh, Pirenne found its way uh, found his way among the writing of a few people, even though they might not be aware of them. But yeah, I mean, the, the way she looks at cities were always, uh, and again, this is a bit paradoxical with what I've said, but I remember a passage in the, the, the life when she describes the history of a building over 150 years, and you know, it was everything, if I remember correctly, from you know, a stable, a general store, a restaurant, a studio, and she says, to him, well, who could have planned that? Who could have thought of that? How can you even possibly think that? And because she was something of a grassroots activist, or at any rate, hanging around a lot of grassroots activists, she always had, for example, in her fight to, to preserve Washington Square as it was and to close it to uh, traffic, a uh, down-to-earth, or I would say even down-to-the-sidewalk uh, perspective that was missing um, among the bureaucrats that she was fighting at City Hall. So her vision is really a bottom-up vision of an organism, a city, or at least a neighborhood, that always changes over time. So even though she did not use uh, the word spontaneous order, and I think uh, she, she should have to, she should have done so, but I'm not going to criticize her for that. Uh, this is really what her whole work is about. It's really, how, again, the death and life. Why do city begins? Why do they grow? Uh, how do they facilitate business formation? How does new work emerge on top of old? Why do things decay? Um, uh, what are? It's funny because uh, when I was uh, again during one of those meetings, I was with the economist Sanford Ikeda, that perhaps some of your listeners know. And Sanford asked her, "Well, what is your main insight?" And the answer that she gave us kind of surprised us a bit. She said, "Fractals." My huh. fractals, and basically what she was arguing is that you know she thinks that she saw patterns, emerging patterns that reproduce themselves at a, at a bigger scale, and then reproduce themselves at a bigger scale, then reproduce themselves at a bigger scale, and that's how she sort of came to understand spontaneous order. You know, the economic activity on the street is not so different than at the level of a city, which then occurs at a bigger level elsewhere. I cannot really convey in a few words. Um, how this squares with her work if you have not read it. But her work was essentially all about the pa- the spontaneous patterns that have formed over thousands of years um, in uh, developed economies. And uh, Because, again, something that economists tend to forget, but one of the first things that you learn in economic geography or urban economics is that, well, what is the biggest economic constant in history? And it's urbanization. No uh, society has ever developed over any significant period of time without the emergence of cities, without people leaving the countryside and getting closer to each other. Now, of course, you can have prosperous, uh, you know, uh, countries like, let's say, Saudi Arabia, where, you know, you, you hit the jackpot in terms of natural resource, and you'll have a lot of wealth, but you're not really creating anything. You're just extracting what you have. Uh, to have a creative economic life, you need cities, going back to basically the origins of agriculture. And somehow the importance of cities, of urbanization, of uh, why you see the same patterns, of course, at uh, you know different speed, different scale, different technologies over time, but the importance, the emergence of cities and of clusters of cities have always been an essential condition of any civilized society from, you know, in central Mexico before the Europeans showed up to uh, northern China, to southern India, to uh, northwestern Europe. Economic development never occurred in history anywhere uh, without cities and a cluster of cities. So 
uh, yeah, if nothing else, by drawing the attention of a number of people who, you know, the, the old joke about economists before the 1990s was that they would make fun of uh, medieval scholars who would argue over how many angels would stand on the hand of a pin, but then they sort of realized, well, our models do stand on the hand of a pin, you know, how much GDP can you put on the hand of a pin? So, uh, the importance of, uh, now, of course, I'm, pre I'm preaching for, uh, you know, for my tribe here as an economic geographer, but the importance of cities and the striking recurrences, spontaneous recurrences of uh, in-city growth in history is something that is really remarkable. And if you focus on that as opposed to, let's say, abstract national aggregates, I think you get a handle on economic development that um, would benefit a lot of economists who don't pay attention to these things still to this day. My guest today has been Pierre de Rocher. Pierre, where can my listeners find you online? Well, I have a website at the University of Toronto. Just uh, Google my name, so P I E R R E, and family name is uh, De Rocher, D E S R O C H E R S, and perhaps throw Toronto in there, and I'm the first thing that will pop up. And I have a fairly detailed website with as many uh, open, open access stuff as I could. Pierre, thank you for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thank you. this episode of Economics Detective Radio, you can head over to economicsdetective.com for additional content and links. The music for this podcast was created by Cassandra McLeod, who you can find at soundcloud.com under the stage name Minaret. That's M-I-N-A space R-E-T. 